All right, so hello everyone. Hope you're having a lovely weekend. And uh, I hope you're looking forward to our webinar today. We're looking forward to telling you lots of information and educating you about uh, the opportunities available abroad to see if it suits you and to see what uh, your thoughts are and to help you as much as possible. So Medlink students, our organization, our team, our advisors, our students, our doctors have gathered today to provide you with all this information, to guide you and give you all the available possibilities that are available for students who would like to consider studying medicine abroad, in English, of course, um, and uh, whether it's physical or online in all of Europe. In this conference, you learn about uh, plenty of topics that you have asked us about, that you have approached us about. So we found the most common questions, the most common topics, and we've gathered them and put them together in this presentation. Um, you'll also hear from our students, their success stories, how they managed to do it, what their anxieties were before they started and how it's going now for them. And uh, with today's great lineup, I believe that it will give you a good whole image of what to expect and uh, how um, the journey starts and how, how it ends. Uh, so you can make an informed decision on what's best for you. Everyone here is ready to share their experiences with you to help you make a confident decision on what opportunities are more suitable for you. So today's lineup, we have uh, some of our expert advisors like Edmund, Tom and Dana, who will tell you more about the opportunities in Europe. You'll have me as your host for the evening. So anything you'd like to discuss or uh, any concerns you have, feel free to shoot them through the chat and I'm more than happy to bring them up to our panelists. We have a great lineup of students who've pursued medicine and dentistry in Europe who are ready to share their experiences with you. Starting with Amy, Amira, uh, Chris, Rashi, Megana, Alikia, Rihan and Aryan. So we're looking forward to having you guys chat with us today. So here is today's outline. So we'll talk to you a little bit about who we are. We'll talk to you about what are the pros of studying medicine in Europe. What are the medical universities that teach medicine in Europe? What it's like, the admission requirements, the entry requirements, and how we can help you the tuition fees and the living costs, where are the degrees recognized, your ability to go back to your home country, and how to deal with the, how medical universities in Europe have dealt with COVID and online studies. And finally, we'll talk about clinical rotations in the UK and the USA and other countries as well. And you, throughout the chat, feel free to ask us as many questions as you have. We will try to answer as many as we can in the next two hours. So, uh, Strap in, prepare yourself, and we're going to give you plenty of knowledge now to help you as much as we can. All right, so we'll start with who we are. Medlink Students is an organization inspired by doctors and medical students who pursued this journey that you're just about to embark on. We started this organization with the hope of providing students with the support, the help, and the uh, necessary um, the necessary information in order for students to make an informed decision on what's best for them. The students have loved us for the past two years and we've become a student's top choice simply because we provide students with first-hand experience provided by doctors, students, dentists, people who've pursued this journey before. We give you all the information, all the facts based on what we've been through. So that way you know that it's gonna be exactly or very similar in the way of what to expect, uh, how it will plan out. And this will encourage you hopefully to see that other people have pursued this dream of theirs of becoming doctors and dentists, whether or not, whether um, they pursued it in their home country or abroad, what matters is we help students pursue what they love to do. We help them fulfill their dreams of becoming doctors. And we, we hope to be able to help you as well and provide you with all this information, all the support that you need in order to also fulfill your dream and give back to the medical community. 
We have full support for you on the ground provided by students themselves who pursue medicine in your also university that you're destined to go to. We have expert advisors for each specific option for each university uh, that will give you the insider tips, the ins and outs of how to go about uh, living in, that in the city, uh, surviving the university, getting through medical school, because we all know medical school is not easy, of course, uh, but it's a very rewarding career. So we'll tell you a little bit about the advantages of studying medicine. We'll tell you why many students have chosen to pursue medicine in Europe. Maybe it sounds a little bit uh, new, this idea to you. But I will ask one of our experts, Edmund, to tell you more about why many and hundreds and thousands of students have pursued medicine over the last several years in Europe. Edmund? Thank you, Osman. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this weekend. Um, we're always really excited to welcome you guys because we see that you're very, very, well, first of all, passionate about wanting to pursue medicine or dentistry. Um, and we'll do everything we can um, with the experiences to make sure you can pursue it. It is very competitive in the UK. Other students that we speak to are from other countries. In the UK currently, in the last year, there are about 30,000 medical school applications. That is a lot. So the universities you know, don't have the resources and you know, the facilities to actually accommodate all these students. So what do these students do? They have to take on degrees that perhaps not really excited about. Now, most students that we talk to are really inspired by past events. Perhaps there was a family member that was ill or with the recent events in the pandemic that's caused them to well, become doctors. So we have to look at all of this and see where we can actually put students. A lot of students are very concerned about going abroad. A lot of students don't have an idea as to what to look for, where to look for. Is it even good to go abroad? And there are so many benefits of going abroad and becoming a doctor and a dentist. So what are these benefits? You know, number one, a lot of the students that go abroad, you get to see the world in a different way. You got to travel, you get to go to all these other countries, and then you get to see different cultures. You know, you might go to the Eastern parts of Europe, you might go to the Western, but then you get to see it in a different way. You become very open-minded. You, you also get to see the education system, how it is like in Europe, how the tutors are like, how they, how they teach, their style of teaching. All of these gives you a very good understanding of a different world. You also get to hone in on your language. You get to learn a new language. Some students who come to us, they actually wanna learn a new language. Some students get to learn some. We have some students in Poland who are learning Polish, but this gives you a very different way of learning much more about yourself. We have students that learn new skills or new interests. They might have to get to new sporting activity. They might join new societies as well. Something that we found out as well is that this gives you a very good career opportunity because a lot of the employers in the home country that you go back to tend to see that the students that study abroad are quite open-minded. So coming back allows you to see, okay, this student has gone abroad. The student is now a doctor from a different country. Let's see what skills they've brought back into the country. So going abroad, whilst it might seem quite daunting at first, it does have its benefits. And this is where we come in to help you. We sit down with you, we, we speak to you about everything that it needs to actually go abroad to become a doctor or a dentist. And we're really proud of the journey that you come through. A lot of the students, they become quite independent because that's the start of this. And we help you really understand what it's like to go abroad. And what's good is these programs are taught in English you know, and they're really affordable and you get the same facilities. A lot of students always think, am I gonna get the same experience as a student in the UK? Absolutely. If not, you'll get more because you get to learn from other patients. You get to see, you get to treat other patients. You get to treat patients from different parts of the world. When you come back to the home country, you get to experience and you become very autonomous. You get to work in any hospital that's given to you and you're very confident in what you do. 
So we're really excited for today and uh, we can't wait to join you, have, it, uh, have you guys join us this year uh, in studying abroad. Over to you, Osman. Thank you, Edmund. That was a really insightful bit there. Thank you for uh, uh, explaining all that. Yes, lots of students have many questions for us about studying abroad, and it's only natural. Even I had plenty of questions as well when I went to, when I first went to Europe. Uh, we expect you to ask us all your questions. We we expect you not to be shy. So feel free to hear us in the Q and A, uh, and shoot uh, shoot at us as many questions as you like. Uh, anything that you heard from Edmund today that you'd like clarification on, just uh, contact us through the Q&A section and uh, we'll answer that for you. So uh, <clears throat> we want to tell you now about the opportunities available for students in Europe. Um, there are medicine and dentistry courses. They teach in English. So all the ones that we will um, tell you about will have English taught courses that are accepted by Europe and uh, the UK and any other countries as well, which we'll talk a little bit about with regards to recognition later on. So there's three routes and uh, three ways to study medicine in Europe. Um, and they are categorized into the following. So the first is undergraduate entry. When you graduate from high school, so let's say you finish your A-levels, you finish your baccalaureate, uh, when you finish, your high school, you'll be able to go into the six year medicine program or the six year dentistry program or five year dentistry program. Uh, for the graduate entry as well, the graduate entry is, is, toward, is for those who have a bachelor's degree in something related to medicine or dentistry, such as biomedical science, nursing, and other subjects as well. And the final one is university transfers. So this is for those who usually will start at university and want to change let's say they start in georgia they change to romania so these are the main routes um edmund would you like to expand a little bit about uh, what i just said absolutely so uh, there are different requirements that are needed for students to pursue medicine so for students that are doing undergraduate a lot of the universities tend to put high school but what is that exactly from the UK, a lot of students study and do medicine. Um, they have A-levels and they finish up to year 13. In, in, university, in countries like Canada, Australia, all around the world, they go up to year 12. So usually to study undergraduates, you need to have science subjects. So A-levels in the UK usually, um, some universities will consider B-Tech um, and then also some universities will consider other things like extended diplomas, but we have to take a look and see what you have. For the students doing graduate entry, this is a student that's done A-levels and then be taking on a degree, say by medical science. Biomedical science is a great degree to, to pursue this program. This is where the university takes a look at what you studied, transfers across the credits that you've done and the modules and allows you entry into a higher year meaning you end up doing as less as four years even. Um, and then the transfers are students that are already studying medicine or dentistry and wish to transfer somewhere else because the experience that they're facing in one university isn't fulfilling what they're looking for. And again, what's required is the transcript is what they've studied, whether they've done the first year, second year, whichever the year they're in, we can help them transfer to another university that will fulfill what they're looking for. So for undergraduates, you're looking at A-levels, sciences, biology, chemistry, or physics, or whatever you have, let us see, and we'll see where we can best help you. Brilliant. Thank you, Edmund. So plenty of opportunities available for students, plenty of routes. It's all up to you to choose the one that suits you best with regards to undergraduate or graduate entry. So we'll move on to the next slide and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about all these universities that are available. Now there's a huge comprehensive list of universities that is available on our website where you can go and see and uh, read all about the opportunities available. Um, we'll tell you about uh, the ones that we've included here are usually the ones that are most popular 
and we brought students from the most popular universities to come and tell you about their success stories today. So, um, firstly, there's uh, Georgia, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland. We've had plenty of students who go to these universities and they choose them as most suitable for them. So I'll ask uh, Tom, our expert advisor from the UK, to tell you more about these options. Thanks, Osman. Yeah, so I think the key word here is opportunities. Uh, whatever grades you've got, whatever your financial situation, there will always be opportunities in Europe. And this is one of the brilliant things. Obviously, if you're a student coming from the UK, you're used to having to get those set grades and having to compete for these very limited spaces. With Europe, the choice is much more with you. The power's in your hands rather than theirs. So you get to choose, you know, based on your budget, based on what kind of cultures you want to explore and based on the kind of education you want to, for you to be delivered to you. Um, it's a fantastic experience wherever you go. Um, but ultimately, as I said, the decision can be yours. I mean, we've got a list here, as you can see, of some of the most popular universities. Uh, but the reality is there are just so many more that are all offering uh, extensive English taught medical and dental courses. Um, and it's just about finding the right one for you. And that's what we're here to do. We're obviously assessing these universities as well ourselves to make sure they're up to that quality and that standard required for our students. So we're here to guide you and to help advise you, but ultimately it's all up to you. You make the decision on where's best for you to go and we'll help you every step of the way. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask our uh, student Alikia here to tell us a little bit more about her experience and how she's found it. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, just a little bit louder, please, Alikia. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, so, hello, guys. My name is Alikia, and like basically, I'm originally from India, but like uh, I have come here abroad in, to Georgia to study medicine. Uh, so, talking about my experience, like Georgia is amazing like especially in the starting as uh, amy said that uh, we are very scared and we are inquisitive as of how excellent would the medical education system there would be in another country because we know the medical education system in our home country but not abroad but uh, like when i reached here the first thing which like really encapsulated me was the nature and the people like the environment here is excellent guys and the people here they are very friendly and like they are very helpful too so uh, like that's what we need, I think, basically, especially when we are away from home and uh, especially talking about my university now that it has plenty of activities apart from the academics all the year, all the year long. So uh, I think what would grab your attention would be the scientific conferences, which is usually organized twice a year. And uh, they are really very interesting because uh, you can show, show off your uh, work throughout the year. Uh, and uh, in a six months gap and then these things are also published in the abstract books uh, the, the yearbook for our own university which is very nice and then there are research projects you could you can get involved in like there are certain trials which are going on in Georgia and then you can be involved through your university uh, what helps a lot here is like the scholarship programs that they have and it helps a lot uh, with the finances and uh, like there are there's a lot of cultural exchange also like the language as Osman was talking about and Edwin was talking about, uh, the language exchange, learning the new language, knowing new people, that's the best part. So uh, if most of you know about IFMSA, like it's the International Federation of Medical Students Association. So uh, getting affiliated with such a big organization through our university, it's very like uh, interesting. They have certain exchange programs and like you can visit another country already being abroad. So that's the best thing. And also the main thing, the students in our university, they get involved in like quality assurance decision making processes, like how the medical education for them should be and how it should be improved. Uh, also, there are funded activities like I myself have been a part of one of the projects recently uh, and I had a chance to uh, go to Slovenia. So like uh, that's that was a very good experience. And uh, apart from these educational activities, there is also a lot of tourism, trekking, rafting and special clubs for, you know, like eat sports if anyone is interested. So like the environment is certain like is such that there is educational activity as well as like apart from academics, there are other extracurricular activities going on so like that was my experience i'm in like now fifth year so uh, that was a lot together to be honest 
All right, thank you for that. Uh, if you guys have any questions about Georgia, then feel free to type in the chat. This is a uh, very good university, European University in Tbilisi. It's a uh, well-accredited university. It has permanent uh, con uh, unconditional accreditation by the WFME. So it's a very reputable place compared to other universities in Georgia. So this is why we've selected this university and we've told you more about it because many students are intelligent. They go and research these options and make sure that they are going to universities that are reliable, that are accredited and uh, recognized in as many countries as possible with minimal problems, without any issues, without any uh, um, concerns that any medical council has raised upon them. So that's why we've hand selected universities to tell you more about because we know that these universities will be reliable for you. All right, so let's move on to the next option, and that would be Romania. So we've got uh, a brilliant student uh, to tell you more about it, and this is Rihan. Rihan, would you tell us a little bit about your experience in Romania? Uh, thank you, Osman. I uh, just want to say good evening to everyone. I can see we've got 133 participants, and everyone logged in for a reason. Um, my experience of Romania has been so far brilliant. I mean, to me, what was most, most important was getting into a medical school and who's going to put me in? Is it going to be Medlink or someone else? And Medlink has uh, delivered according to the promises. I mean, we go from London to Manchester. It takes, what, four or five hours. But London to Romania is only three hours. So distance is not a big, big problem, you know. I mean, in the UK, I, I, I've at least applied uh, three, four, five times I couldn't get in. And there's so much hurdle from the point you have to get all your A stars, then your um, UCAT and then interview and all of that. You as if made to believe that medicine is impossible, but it is not. We've got so many choices um, all across Europe. There's brilliant universities and you are tested to a very rigorous standard. I mean, I started my, semester one with four module and now we're at on semester two 11 module I've got one more exam to do um, next week on Friday and then I'm done I can come back to UK and work and do whatever I like um, it's from the Crove airport to uh, Crove Medical University only 12 minutes of drive there's so much life out there you know you've got cafe restaurant um, nightlife everything is there it's just like you feel like it's, it's it's almost like London. So um, you don't feel like you're missing anything. The most important thing is getting on board. Um, and the sooner you do it, the better it is. As you know, I've been following Medlib for at least about three, four years. I wish I go on the you know, journey three, four years ago. I've been in my uh, fourth or fifth year, but I'm on my first year and I'm continuing. Um, so uh, overall, my message is, you know, get on board as fast, as quick as possible. And the most important thing is getting into a medical university and then fulfilling your dream. If you are 18 years old, if you are 19 years old, or even 20, six years is nothing for you. You will come out with a medical degree, make yourself proud, make your parents proud. And when you go to your GP and you see someone in the stethoscope, you say, oh, I'm also that one. So there's nothing to be feel regret about, you know, it's all happy and you will fall into PC. Thank you everyone for listening. Brilliant, uh, Rihan. Just one thing you mentioned is that, uh, you, as you guys know, he's been, um, um, I think, uh, Rihan, you phrased it like this. As you guys know, I've been with you for three years. Rihan only signed up last year. He's been with us for three years since 2018. Oh, is it four years now, I think? It's four years, four years. Yeah. Um, uh, I've contacted you first, yeah. Yeah, I remember Rihan messaged me on my Facebook profile and he was like, Osman, I need some advice about studying abroad. And uh, it's really nice to see, you know, after three years of him doing his research, um, you know, he had his concerns, he had his worries, as you all have as well. Most students are uh, anxious a little bit about going to a completely new country that they've never set foot in or never spoken the language of. Uh, but Rihan finally, after four years, decided, you know what, I'm going to give it the leap of faith and I'm going to go 
and try it. What do you think, Rehan? Do you think it would be better to not sit on it for two years, even six months, one year, whatever? Uh, do you think people should just go for it? it? Would you have done that if you could go back? Well, uh, I mean, I've done my biomedical science and then uh, BSc biomedical science, and then I've done a master's degree, sorry, in nursing. So as a practitioner in the UK, the whole reason, I mean, I'm a kind of over suspicious person. I want to see what is uh, being promised is authentic and is genuine. And, and I do regret that it's taken three, four years and so many calls and so many convincing. I wish I'd go on it four years ago. Now I could have been on my fifth year, but the most <laughs> important uh, message to people like this is that do your research um, and people um, do your research. There's a lot of companies out there. And if we are nurses and we are healthcare professionals, we're coming forward and we're telling you that these companies are genuine, um, you can get a lot out of them, then it is true, okay? So I didn't believe the fact that, you know, Medlink and Edmund will put me into a medical university in Romania. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I went there in October, I flown from uh, Luton to uh, Luton Airport to um, Caribia. And I went actually to the admission office and then I've seen my folder there, my passport, my qualification, all of that has been scanned into the computer, the university computer. Then I came to believe actually it is genuine. I mean, and until this date, I cannot even believe that I am doing medicine. I mean, I, think I sometimes call Edmund and say, did you put me into your medical school? And he says, no, you are in medical school. Even I look at my card, it's this one. And I think, is this true? Because, you know, we've gone through so much in the UK. I mean, so many rejections. If you applied for five times, six times, then you couldn't even get an interview. Can you imagine? So it's, it's still difficult to believe that Medlink has delivered um, what he has promised. So my, my advice is um, do your research. There's so many universities and, and get in. You know, don't, don't waste time, um, but do research. And fulfill your dream. You don't. It's medical is not med, medicine is not impossible. You don't. Ha, you don't need uh, three, four A stars. You still with reasonable grade, you can get in into good universities. Thank you. Thank you, there, Rihan. All right, let's move on to the next one. So we'll be talking a little bit about Bulgaria. Uh, let's start with Chris. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your experience when you first started three years ago? I, uh, yes, three years ago, I, I uh, came to Varna to study medicine. Uh, well, at the start, I was a bit worried, you know, because it's a new country, new culture. Like, I don't know how to act. Maybe I do something normal. People might get offended. But, uh, yeah, after, uh, I mean, first week, I was a bit nervous. But after that, after you know, speaking to some Bulgarians myself, uh, friends, making friends with other people in my group, uh, yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, I guess uh, if you're worried about applying, like this new culture, everything, I'd say after a while you get used to it easy. You know, like uh, someone mentioned earlier about learning the language. Uh, I can speak a little bit Bulgarian now, but uh, it goes away. They really appreciate you when you speak their language. So I guess that helps. Uh, Anything else, Osman? Okay, what would you say the highlight of your journey has been, uh, Chris, coming abroad and uh, taking that leap of faith? Um, I know, I'd say more confident, I guess. Like, making, uh, I was surprised of how many people who are here in Varna from different uh, countries, uh, backgrounds. So, uh, just making friends with them, you know, seeing like different uh, sides of life. I guess made a bit more confident uh, about myself, you know, talking to people, strangers, it's fine now. Okay, yeah, uh, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, usually parents of students, they are asking us, uh, oh, I'm not sure about sending my uh, son or daughter abroad on their own. I don't know if they'll be able to uh, survive on their own and so on. What would, you, what would you say based on your experience with your family as well and moving abroad? Uh, yeah, I'm, at the start, my parents were, same as me, worried, like how I would live on my own, because I've always lived with my parents. Um, I guess the first few uh, months were a learning curve for me, for sure, like learning how to uh, live on my own. But um, I mean, my parents, they regularly well, tried to visit me before COVID happened. So uh, there's that support network there. Uh, 
I mean, if they were worried about anything, they, they could have contacted you. I think they did a few times just asking on my behalf any problems that, that uh, but you were there to help me out when they asked. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Chris. So let's uh, ask as well Rashi, who is uh, a top student studying in Plovdiv University. Rashi, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your experience studying in Bulgaria and what it's been like? Yes, so um, first of all, hi everybody. <laughs> um, my amazing journey kind of started around 2019. Um, I was searching the internet like all of you are probably right now. Um, for information on studying abroad and then I came across Medlink's website and um, I got in contact with Edmund and he answered all my little annoying questions um, but that year I didn't get in I took a gap year instead because I guess I was a bit afraid um, like coming abroad and then uh, the next year they all like Edmund stayed in contact with me which is pretty great because I think um like if you look at other agencies, they don't really like come back to you and ask you like, hey, did you get into uni? Or like, what are you doing now? Like, are you still searching or anything? So Edmund asked, and that's kind of my reason of choosing Medlink as my agency. Um, and they even help you with like paperwork and applying and getting into the university and even with like exam prep uh, for the entrance exam. Um, but yeah, like, Studying abroad can be very intimidating, especially because it's a whole new experience. Um, but I really enjoy it. Like, I also have a sister that's just graduated last year from Varna. And um, she she was kind of like, like the perfect image for me because I was like, okay, this is what I want to do as well when I go abroad. So I got kind of excited for that. Um, and yeah, she kind of helped me look forward to university and like uni life in Bulgaria abroad. You learn a lot of independence and like just responsibilities, cooking yourself, cleaning yourself, everything is just, it's, it's a great experience. Thank you, Rashi. That is a very, it's reassuring to see students from different backgrounds, people from uh, all over the world coming over to Europe with the same ambition, the same dream of pursuing medicine or dentistry, wanting to be part of the front fields of healthcare, which is uh, really exciting and it's a huge adventure as well. You will learn a lot and gain a lot of experience and skills, being able to be independent and it will help you grow up fast. And that's really important as a doctor. You need to grow up fast, you need to be responsible and uh, these are the privileges, the, the things that you should respect and uh, have. So that's really nice to see everyone here is very professional in the way they, uh, they talk and the way they present themselves and uh, talk about their experience as well. Um, we'll move on now to the next option, which is uh, Poland. So we'll ask uh, our student from last year, Arian, who is a very good student as well, who's uh, been uh, really um, lucky to have the opportunity to pursue medicine there. Arian, would you be able to tell us more about your journey and how you found it? Yes, so I just want to say hello everyone. My name is Arian. I am a first year student currently at Medical University in Białystok in Poland. I just want to say that uh, I've had a very good experience so far. I would like I would say if I was to go one year back and to, like predict how it would be right now, I would uh, look at it with like a positive attitude, but I don't think I would expect it to be as good as it actually is. I want to say that Poland in general, why like it's good, it's because first of all, it's very cheap in general, like for about 400 to 500 pounds monthly, you will be able to get a very nice apartment, like really, really good apartments for that amount, like price. Uh, the locations where uh, we currently live, the good thing is that because the students are like very close to each other. So for example, the dorms, which I live in, the price is like 750 as well in monthly, which is 150 pounds monthly, right? And like for the facilities that we get, I think it's really good because it's very close to the university. It's 15 minutes walk, with, um, also, what happens uh, like is that everyone has like their own fridge, everyone has their own toilet. It's not really like that much shared. It's like they provide everyone to have like their own facilities in here. For example, I have a fifth year Spanish roommate. He's like, I've made really good friendship with him this year. I don't think I would actually expect to make such a good friendship with like a roommate. 
which I think is a good thing. Uni is around, like I said, 15 minutes from the dorms. The good thing is the apartments where students usually uh, live in, they're very, they're like, I would say, on the other side of the street. So the good thing is, like, let's say if you have, make really good friends here, your friends will literally be about five to 10 minutes away from you. So you're always like close to each other. You know, you can always like see each other and that's not much of like a problem, I would say. Transport is also very easy because we live uh, 10 minutes away from the city center and everywhere where we usually want to go is no longer than 15 minutes of walk. Like everything is just seems to be like, I would say so close to where we usually live. Let's say, okay, sometimes like the, you know, you might have to go somewhere a little bit more fast. So let's say 25 minutes walk. So you'll get a taxi. Taxi will usually be no more than five pounds wherever you want to go. Like, like I said, everything is really cheap. Also, we have like these little electric scooters and they, let's say for like a 20 minute ride, it would be like two pounds. So like I said, it's honestly like for the price, you can do like a lot of things. And I think you would be able to save a lot. For example, if you were to, you know, study in the United Kingdom. City is two hours away from Warsaw and, you know, like the capital city. I went there a few times. It's a very nice city, but I would say like, let's say, if I was to study in Warsaw, I think because there's so much happening and it's so loud, very busy. It's, I don't think I would actually rather choose to study there, but it's always good for like a change. Like let's say you go out like with your friends over the weekend, it's always going to be like an enjoyable time. The fact that I made so many good connections with people in the uni, I think uh, I got more involved this year because obviously this is like my first year. So I expected to do so many things, but because of the virus, the university, you know, it couldn't really provide us with all the events. However, because like I said, I made so many like friends, like good connections. We always uh, have like an opportunity to do like events organized by the students. So we would make me talk about like the, their apartments, like very, very big apartments. Like I said, because some people like come to this uh, university to Poland, there'll be like countries like let's say Norway. Norway is a very, very rich country. So these people will have like these amazing apartments and it will literally cost them no more than 600 pounds per month. And like for that amount, they'll have really good like um, places to live. So, like I said, it's a shame because I didn't really have much to do this you know, like um, like I said this year in the university. But what I can say from my own experience is that the university tries to work with the students in general rather than like you know always going on by like the rules and like they're actually not so strict. Like like I said, they try to like understand the students. They're often like quite lenient, which I realize. I don't think much uh, many universities will be as lenient as like they've been with us this year. Like they've been really really tolerant. I'm actually quite surprised at that. They helped us a lot. They obviously won't be like that with everything, but considering like all the things we've done, we feel really, I, I personally myself feel really grateful. I feel like from my experience, like going to school in the UK and like the education in general, what I remember is everything would be very much like, oh no, th these are the rules and you can't, like nothing else. It's like the option, like it's just the rules. And if you don't do well, then whatever, like you just fail and everything. But I feel like um, in the UK, they definitely won't be as lenient as let's say if you were to study in Bialystok which is where I'm currently studying. So I feel quite lucky, you know, to be where I currently am and like have the opportunity to like, you know, uh, like, like I say, if I, if I personally had the opportunity to go like to other like bigger cities and like more known, because I have friends, for example, who study in Warsaw and the impression that they gave me is that Warsaw is very strict, like crazy. Like, so, you know, I would actually much rather stay where I currently am. And I'm just happy with the, you know, the location in general and like the way I've settled myself. I've also, I've also realized that people like here, like from the old years are were actually very helpful. It was like, they made us feel very welcome, surprisingly very helpful, like showing us around the city and like, uh, you know, like where to find everything. It's, you know, the one thing that I really like is that all the years, it's not like, okay, first year sang out with first year, second year, it's like, it's not separated like that. Like I actually, if anything, it's actually very mixed. Like I got to meet a lot of the old years and like once like they even like invited me, like I said, because, you know, I tried to get involved. All these, the old years, they invite, invited me to go to like paintball and like these like, you know, cool things to do. Like obviously, although it's the like, you know, we've got the whole coronavirus situation, so there's not much to do. I would say students in general are very interconnected. For example, everyone in IA seems to talk to each other, although like, you know, we've not had the opportunity to go into classes and like get to know each other but like the fact that they're still making that effort to you know like talk to each other and keep in contact I think it helps especially with studies because I would say personally there's been like certain subjects which I struggle with and if I hadn't like seek the help from my friends which were actually quite open to help me 
I don't think how it actually passed. So that's like a good thing. The university also has its own like hospital and like very close to the location that we live in with like modern facilities, which obviously helps us to get like a fun, further understanding in like and perspective into the medical field. For example, I remember we had like first aid lessons and they had like, they had an ambulance in the room. And I remember everyone was very surprised, like how do they get an ambulance? But you know, it's like the commitment that they make. It's like really good. For example, in my situation, I came to Poland this year when I was 18, right? So I was one of the youngest people. I realized that like a lot of people in my year are slightly older than me, most of them probably in their 20s, you know. There were also people around my age, even younger. But what I'm trying to say is that I never really put myself at a disadvantage just because I was younger, right? So let's say there are all these people that come, come from like different countries, like Norway, Sweden, Germany. They're actually very open to get to know each other, like the cultural cultural differences. I think that the... I would say that the thing that massively helped me is I came with a very open mindset. That where like I told myself that at the end of the day, everyone's going through the same thing. Everyone's going to, you know, stress because it's their first year. They're not familiar. Or like, let's say they'll put like themselves in, like these negative, like deceiving thoughts. But when, when you actually come here and you start talking to everyone, you, let, you realize that it's nothing really what you kind of thought it would be like, like, oh, it would be this. And like, you know, I think it's mainly what it actually like, um, how do I say that? Uh, what it depends on is the person. Like, what kind of like, how how are you like? What is your approach to all of this? You know, like for example, like I, I'm you know, although I'm a representative right now, I'm trying to like to, like convince you why this isn't just me. Like, you know, there's more than hundred people watching right now. I wouldn't want to like to just deceive people, and, like you know, to go through this experience, and, like pay all these fees and come out uh, to you know to know that their experience was like a disaster. This is just you know, <laughs> I'm just telling you like how like how it was for me. So I would say with a positive mindset, you just get to know as many people, like, uh, you know, you'll actually come off, like everything will be fine at the end of the day. Obviously, not everyone will always make the extra effort to start the conversations, like, you know, talk to each other. But at the end of the day, if you are the person to make that extra effort, it will definitely pay off. If you're able to form like a stable social network around you, it will be very ad ad advantageous to you. I will definitely wouldn't underestimate that point. And I also want to mention that when I was first applying, Edmund massively helped me. Like, because I, you know, at first I made like an inquiry. I was not really like looking much forward to like studying abroad and everything. But then, you know, I started like asking more questions. And like, as Edmund, like, you know, he was like always there for me. He, he would always like make sure that everything is okay. He would always, he was always there to like, you know, just ask like, if, you know, about everything and, and to help. So that was the really like a smooth transition. Like, even I would say, I applied very late. I remember the date that I kind of made the decision decision that I wanted to come was late August. So, you know, Medlinks was actually helpful enough to email the university just to arrange like a specific date for me to have my, you know, uh, my exam online. Because if, if, if that hadn't happened, then I definitely wouldn't have been here and I wouldn't have gone through like this really good experience, which honestly, like, I'm, I'm just very happy to, you know, have. Thank you. All right, brilliant. Uh, wow, Aryan, so much information there. Thank you so much for that. We should make a webinar for you only. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, that's really good. I'm so thankful that you gave so much information for our students. I think uh, potential students always have plenty of questions. We can see that in the Q&A. If you have any questions for any of our students, then just uh, shoot them at the, in the Q&A and uh, our students will answer them for you like Arian, Amy, Amira, Alikia, Chris, Rihan, Rashi, everyone will answer your questions for you. So just uh, write them in the Q&A section and uh, we can even come back to them later on if needed. So next we will discuss uh, admission requirements. So lots of students worry and they stress, oh, will I be accepted? Um, how can I know that I am gonna get accepted? So they have these kinds of concerns. Um, so. I would like to bring in our expert advisor to tell you more about this and uh, talk to you about how she discusses with students their ability to um, get entry in Europe and how we help students maximize their potential of getting in. Dana, are you there? Yep. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I really hope today inspires a lot of questions and ideas where we can give you a lot of information. I can see the Q&A, it's, it's shooting so many questions for us and we hope to answer all the questions for you. 
So my job here is to speak to students to help you choose the right university. We focus on trying to see what you have for qualifications, your high school diploma, or whether you have a graduate degree, like you've studied biomedical science or anything related to uh, biology or chemistry. We take a look at your transcripts. We try to help you find the right university based on your qualifications. And we also focus on uh, knowing where you come from, understanding your culture, because we don't only focus on it's very important to go and study at a top university and have the best education possible. But for us, because we have been our doctors and medical students that have been speaking uh, thanks to them, sharing their experience, we understand how hard it is when you relocate and it's very important to help you find the right place. So we try to understand where you come from, your culture. And when we get on the call with you, we take a look at your file, we assess your uh, high school, and then we start discussing with you the universities that you are qualified to apply to. And then also we try to describe the university, the city and the country that you are going to, to ensure that we and you, we are picking and hand picking the right university for you, where you will have the best education possible, graduate as a phenomenal doctor at the same time, have a very nice experience and enjoy the six years you're staying with us. So usually students go on the university's websites and they try to find the requirements and how I can apply. And it's usually overwhelming for students because it's a bit complicated. Some most of the universities require the basic sciences, biology, chemistry, math, physics, and some students don't have these. And at the same time, it's also confusing for students because each country has a different system in the high school. There's a British system, the A-levels, there's American uh, high school, there is IB, there is a Middle Eastern uh, high school uh, system. So each country has its own system. What we do here is take a look at your transcripts and advise you in the best uh, direction. And we will tell you which universities you meet their requirements and which universities you qualify to apply to. Now, when, when you bring your transcripts, first of all, we help you find the right university. If you don't have the basic sciences, feel free to get in touch with us. And of course, we will help you find the university. Some universities might ask you to have an entrance exam. There's an entrance exam that is usually MCQs, or it could be an interview for 20 minutes, asking you questions related to biology, chemistry, the sciences, and asking you about yourself. Also, our job here is to prepare you for the interviews and the exams. We give you material where we know that if you study the material we give you, you should pass the exam with flying colors. You don't need to worry about that. We are there to support you with the application and with the entrance exam to ensure that you perform really well. Also, um, some universities require the language proficiency, uh, the IELTS or the TOEFL. We prepare you for that too. We help you prepare. If you don't have it, also feel free to get in touch with us and we will help you. We speak to the university, we get in touch with them and uh, we tell you how we can apply and what documents we can uh, put into your file. For graduate entry students, it's the same. Uh, we require an extra uh, document, which is your university transcripts to help you equivalate your uh, transcripts and subjects that you have studied. We also take a look at your uh, transcripts. Our expert doctors, they specialize in equivalations. They will take a look at your transcripts and we'll advise you which year of entry you will get and which universities you're qualified to apply to. Most importantly is we tend to focus on helping you find the right university, help you ensure that in September, 2021, you will be joining medical school and starting your journey to achieve your dream and become a doctor. At the same time, helping you choose the right university, right country, to make sure you have a very fun experience. Six years that you will never forget when you are a very successful doctor in the future. So feel free guys to book a call with us. It's for free. Uh, we'll discuss and we'll try to give you as much information as possible uh, to help you achieve your dream and become a doctor.
Thank you, Dana. That is a very good comprehensive uh, talk about mission requirements. This is what we do to summarize. Our job is to, the reason we do what we do is because we want to help you secure your entry into medical school. We want you to get in. We want you to have the least possible stress, the least possible uh, um, agitation with it because it's a very tough process. That's what we're here for, to make sure your file has the, produces the best possible outcome for you. We will make a very strong file for you and a very strong case to the university. All right, so uh, let's go on to the next slide and that's how can we help you? So I'd like to bring in our expert advisor, Edmund, who can tell you a little bit more about this and uh, share what he shares with students on a daily basis on what we do and why we do what we do. Thank you, Osman. Uh, it's been really inspiring listening to everyone. Um, so when we have an inquiry, um, one of the things that we want to do is really get to understand the student. We want to get to know you. We want to understand really what inspired you to pursue medicine and what's, what's inspired you to pursue dentistry. We want to understand what's motivated you and what your budget is, what you're looking for in the universities, what things that you would want, what type of city you would like to live in. Because we get some students that might be really shy and want to go to a smaller city, you know? And we have other students that, you know, the life of the party want to be in a bigger city because that matches their personality. We have to understand all of this. And then we discuss with you, perhaps your parents as well, which options would be most suitable for you? Because every student that comes to us will have different requirements and what they would like from a university. Now, only, not only that, we want to ensure that even afterwards, we're not just going to throw you in the university and hopefully you survive out there. We want to ensure that you get the support that you need there. We come and meet with you. We will also ensure that you get the support you need on the ground throughout your years of study before you come back and then work as a doctor or dentist. The consultation that we have with you is free. And we also provide you support on the ground throughout so that you don't have to worry about calling your parents every single week. And we know some of you students are mature and you can look after yourself, but going to a different country requires settling in. You've never been to these countries. So we want to make sure that every step of the way we're, we're guiding you through it so that anything that you need is there so that you can study and concentrate on the studies. All these students that we've spoken to, Ariane, um, Amy, all of these students were quite anxious, but they went there with an open mind. So let us speak with you, whatever the case might be, maybe you're thinking about going abroad. Maybe the thought is there, but you're not sure yet. Let's speak with you and discuss how we can help you because it's getting competitive in these countries and the European universities are welcoming to all the students that wanna pursue their dream. And we are here to help you along the journey. Back to you, Osman. Thank you for that, Edmund. Uh, that was very insightful. Exactly. That's what we're here for. Edmund's trying to tell you that we're here to help you to make sure you have the best possible outcome and hopefully so you can get into medical school because every year many students give up on their dream of becoming doctors or dentists and uh, then they decide, oh, you know what, I'll just settle for science or biology. And that's what I did as well. And uh, I wish I went to Europe when I was 18, instead of postponing it and sitting on it and not making a decision, because it's very tough to make a decision. But that's what we're here for, to give you all the information so you can make the best and most informed decision on your future and what's best for you. So you can graduate sooner, become a doctor sooner and be competitive once you uh, graduate, enter the hospital, start to practice, because we love seeing our graduates uh, start working we love to see our doctors succeed and go back to their countries. And that's why we're with you every single step of the way. Anything you need, all our students here have uh, reassured you, I hope, that we are here for you. Whatever you need from us, we're always very uh, available. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And I'll ask uh, our expert advisor, Tom, to tell you more now about these logistics and these facts which are also possible for you to get more information on, on our website. 
Uh, but Tom, would you be able to expand a little bit more on the following? Yes, of course. Thanks, Osman. Um, so as you can probably see here, there is a little bit of a pattern. Um, and that pattern is that the tuition fees tend to equate to the living costs. Um, this is because if you're going to a country where the cost of living is particularly low, the expenses for the university are typically lower. And this means that they charge less on the tuition fees. Now, what it doesn't mean is that you're getting any less of an education, as I'm sure the students speaking today um, from places like Georgia and Bulgaria will tell you, the quality of education they get is fantastic over there. So the cost really doesn't equate to the quality. It just comes down to the cost of living in the country. Um, I also heard earlier, obviously, with Poland, um, it's still a lot less than what you'd expect to be paying in the UK. And yet you're still getting that qualification that's going to help you to achieve your dreams. And again, it just comes down to preference. Some people, you know, have different budgets. Some people have higher budgets, lower budgets. The point of the matter is, whatever your budget is, there is an opportunity for you here. There are options for you here. And there is a way that you're going to be able to get into medicine and succeed. And that's the main point to sort of take away from there. Thank you, Tom. That's very good. Yes, um, tuition fees and living costs vary and a lot of students ask us about them and how they can fund their education. Now, the majority of students usually self-fund. So usually they will take uh, money from their parents or work a part-time job, save some money or uh, find some support uh, from people that would be able to support them financially until they graduate and then be able to return their money, the money back to their parents, their grandparents, uncles, or whoever. Uh, but again, if you would like more information about this, we can always help you. The great thing about Europe is that you can live a very comfortable lifestyle for such a small amount of money that in the UK, for example, you would get dorms that are uh, as small as chicken huts for thousands of pounds. Uh, whereas here in Europe, you get a full apartment with a you know, plasma TV, huge plasma TV, very nice, uh, brand new um, furniture, and it's so comfortable and nice for like 300, 400 pounds. Uh, you can get something really, really nice and uh, uh, comfortable for you as well. So you live very nice and comfortably and be able to enjoy your years abroad rather than uh, um, live in a small area, small space and share, but you can do if you want, and you can save a lot of money by living in a shared space. Uh, like hostels, for example, or dorms, as they're called in the UK. Um, uh, so we'll, uh, if you have any more questions about this, feel free to type in the chat and our students will ask you more, uh, will answer them for you. So um, we'll talk a little bit about how universities have been coping with COVID because a lot of students ask us, is it safe? Can I go abroad? And uh, this is a very common question. But Despite COVID, despite uh, pandemics, it's even though it's a huge insight for us in the medical field to see something firsthand like this, you know, something that we've never heard of before, never seen before uh, in our generation uh, that happened hundreds of years ago, you know, pandemics and uh, epidemics. So it's really fascinating to see and to see the world react to it and learn how to deal with it and adapt to it. And that's what uh, is amazing as well in the medical field. The medical field is a constantly advancing uh, profession. Every day there's something new. Every day there's research, there's new updated information. That's why it's so important to stay up to date uh, with the latest information, news and so on in healthcare. And you guys have that privilege with having access to universities that are able to adapt and um, be able to continue teaching medicine despite all these social restrictions and not being able to attend in person, like Ariane and Amy talked about with online studies. So I'd like to ask Amy, how have you found the online studies during the pandemic for your university? Okay, hi again, everyone. It's me. <laughs> um, so online learning has obviously, I would say that like online learning is never like re fully replaced offline learning. Um, at first, it was a lot of getting used to like the format, like the use of new technology. Um, even some of the lecturers like with um, organizing like Google Meet, how to present your screen and stuff like that, just the little things, um, getting that organized. 
but after that after like about a, about a week of doing online studying you get into a good routine and everyone's really not only the students but also the teachers all help each other um organize um stuff like that um i'd say you actually talk more everyone's on their phones now so you have like group chats so you're still um able to communicate a lot um we made like a lot of uh, study groups so you have your um you have your class but then people like to study in smaller groups you can do like zoom meetings together so um like everyone really helps each other and getting used to the whole new format we have an online portal which is where everything uh, that uh, the, the from presentations to uh, recorded lectures um, they're all uploaded to the portal as well as your timetable it's all in one place it's still under a bit of development but it is a great resource there um, and yeah so in terms of um, resources and organization it's been great um, the only thing I think is that it, online learning, you have to be much more motivated um, to get up every day. I always got up still, like got ready as if I was going out just to like get myself motivated um, like that. But also online learning is a great way, like my first semester I did online. So it's a great way to save money. I lived at home. Um, so it's great. And as well, if you want to stay, if you have responsibilities or want a part time job, you've got that. Um, so it has been a good experience. I'm glad I've done a bit of online learning, but I'm definitely looking forward to more offline classes. Um, yeah. And obviously with COVID, it's great because you don't get COVID. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Amy. And uh, Arian as well, you mentioned some uh, information about how your year has been online, your first year. Would you be able to just quickly summarize how you found it as well with the university adapting and teaching you and uh, giving you the skills that you require? Yes. Yeah, so as I said, you have, told, you have just mentioned, we have had the year mostly online, but because there are actually a lot of advantages that people don't take into account. I would say because, for example, we are medical students, right? So most of the time, most of the day should be invested into studying. Now, the whole thing is if you want to go to classes, there's like all this time you have to wake up early. You have to like prepare yourself, like, you know, like get ready for the class. And then, you you know, the transport and that actually takes, you know, a little bit of time sometimes, especially let's say if one of your classes is finished and you have to go to another class. And what the good thing is about having online classes, it saves you a lot of time a lot of time so let's say you know you finish your classes you don't have to like wake up like two hours before you know you can you know you can get like more sleep that day you can be more focused for the whole day that will help you because let's say i think a lot of students what they do is they don't get much sleep overnight and i'm talking about like you know normal normal conditions so let's say physical classes they don't get much time overnight because let's say they've been studying till late and then oh they have class at 8 a.m they have to wake up 6 a.m get to the class and then that causes them to either be tired throughout the whole day or let's say, you know, they have to sleep in the day, which like, again, like it's, it's time consuming. So the one good thing is about this, it takes, it gives us a lot more time to do other things, which we would like throughout the day. And the, also the university has actually prepared themselves quite well, I would say, because what they always do is obviously no one, I think a lot more people would prefer to have it in person because also you can talk to the students and, you know, you can discuss things. However, the one thing is, is, they will always prepare the classes very well. Like let's say in class, they would like, for example, I will give a, an example for anatomy. Anatomy is very like, I would say something that should be more done in class because you have like all these parts of the body and you want to like have like a good look around like how everything looks, you know, like the different parts of it, you know. And obviously with pictures, it's, it's not really the same thing. However, what they often do is they will show us through the camera or they will send us a video which they have already pre-made. So we can have, so it's almost like it's in person, you know, because they show like a video and like you can see like how everything looks. So I think with the whole preparation thing, it's really good. And like I say, it saves a lot of time. So it's not always like the worst outcome. And obviously like we are medical students, but at the end of the day, we also want to do other things. And this is what it's really good for. Like we have time to do other things, which is, you know, like because of the whole online concept of what's going on. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Arian. 
That's very nice and insightful from both of you and Amy. So uh, for our UK students, I know we deal with students from every corner of the planet, but some of our UK students still ask us about Brexit. Will it impact my degree? Will it affect my ability uh, to come back home or work in the UK even if I graduate from Europe? Um, I'm sure our UK students here have done their research as well. So I'd like to ask uh, Amira, what has been your experience with uh, uh, Brexit and uh, your research, your personal research and personal approach about it? Does it worry you? Does it uh, stress you out that uh, the UK has left Europe or uh, um, do you think it's uh, not a big deal? Oh, it really does not matter. It really doesn't. At the end of the day, for example, with UK, with medicine, you have to do your UK MLA. Everyone has to sit for it. So it doesn't affect us. Plus, most of your exam, for example, in the DMI, most of your exam prepare you for the uh, PLAB or UK MLA, even for dentistry. Someone asked me in the question before. We have the ORE exam to do. So the croc exam that we do prepare you for it i'm not stressed about it i mean it it's you just move you just finish your exam you have to go and it's the same it's just another exam you just go for it and you shouldn't be worried you still have jobs available um if you see there's still a lot of students who are going back and coming they've done the research my research mainly says that it doesn't affect us and it doesn't matter just apply for it and you know fulfill your dream brilliant uh, thank you amira um so just some questions that have come up from the forms that students submitted to us will there be any changes with admission requirements no there will not be so it's not different for uh, students from different parts of the planet so much so it's quite uh, similar uh, and tuition fees and uh, living costs do not change based on your nationality. So um, in many countries or many universities. Um, so basically, it'll be very similar still and not so different. The only difference is that uh, British students need to make a student visa when they come to Europe. And uh, many students from our conference here have made a student visa to go abroad. So they can tell you about their experience. So um, Medling were great, they gave me a full document with step by step what I needed to do, like regarding the visa process, making an interview. It was um, pretty simple. The only thing I had a bit of trouble with was COVID insurance, but that's because of COVID. <laughs> um, hopefully COVID um, will be over soon. Um, but yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It's just another, just a little step that needs to be done because of this new law. Brexit. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's not so hard. Uh, exactly. It's just an extra step, maybe a little bit more effort, but we'll guide you and help you with that. Rihan, also you studied in Romania, so you had to make a visa, right? How did you find the process with the embassy in London and uh, doing the, the this paperwork? Um, Osman, I've um, entered uh, before Brexit into Romania, I think uh, last year in October. The Brexit was in um, December. <laughs> so yes, and then they've, um, I mean, prior to Brexit, if you go there, they just print you a small paper with a CNP number in Romania, and that's it, that's your residence and all that. But um, this semester, they've um, told students to apply for visa. So what basically that means, you just go to a local immigration office, we've got one about 10 minutes of walk, and you go there with your passport, and they, they might, they now ask you just to, um, accommodation um, contract, you know, housing contract. So if you have three months of housing contract, um, you just show that to them and, and they say, come back after three, four weeks. And they just basically print, print you a card um, and, it, and it just says article 50 on the temporary, the permit. So, so for British um, students, it's, it's just about going to the, popping into the immigration office and just showing your contract, um, maybe two months or three months for your living. And then they tell you come back after four weeks and then they just simply print you a card with five years on it. And it, it, it quotes something called article 50 something something. And that's it. It's, it's, not, it's, it's just, uh, you're just printing a card. Um, it's not a big deal like to show them bank account detail and et cetera, et cetera. As far as I know for British student, it's very simple. Just uh, visit to the immigration office, that's it. And, and sorry, the university just to write to the uh, migration office that you're a student. 
that's the two requirements so far. That's far as I know, and I got my card. We'll help you with all this. Thank you, uh, guys, for explaining this. We'll help you with all the visa and the processes and the documents you require. All right, let's uh, move on to the next slide. We uh, want to keep some time for the Q&A so everyone can answer some questions. Um, so where are the degrees recognized? I'll leave this for our expert, Edmund, to tell us more about uh, how he tells students and reassures them about this uh, kind of concern. Thank you, Osman. Now, one of the things that we do is to continuously always look for universities that allows the students to graduate and go back to their respective countries. Majority of our students obviously are from the UK. So most students want to come back to the UK and work as doctors. And we would want nothing more for you guys to come back and really work as doctors in the UK. Now, most of the concerns for students are, are the degrees recognized? Absolutely. The degrees are recognized in the UK by the General Medical Council. Now the General Medical Council have requirements of what they would like to see a student come back with. Some of it being how many years you studied medicine for. Now in the UK, medicine is for five years. Now, if you're doing postgraduates, normally it's three. The other thing they want to see is the number of hours you studied for in total. So this excludes obviously independent studying. This is you doing lectures, you doing seminars, you doing the rotations, everything. And then also they check the World Health Organization directory of medical schools to ensure that the university is listed there. These are some of the things that the General Medical Council looks for. Now also, they do everything on a case by case. But what we do is we look for all the universities that meet the requirements that have experience of students coming back and registering with the Medical Council. Now, this ties in with the other thing that people were talking about Brexit. The General Medical Council will be introducing a new exam, which will include everyone, whether you studied medicine in the UK or whether you studied abroad. Now for dental students, uh, the General Dental Council only requires two things when you come back to the UK. One of it being the degree has to have completed at least 1,600 hours of rotations and then also to sit the uh, all, uh, overseas registration exam, which is in short the ORE. Now, are the degrees also recognized in other countries? Absolutely. You're looking at the US, Australia, by the Australian Medical Council. You're looking at other countries like Canada. We also have students from there as well. So wherever you decide to go, we will then listen with you and find the universities that are recognized pretty much anywhere in Europe, in Australia, in Canada, in the UK, so you can still work. And you're not limited to just working in one country alone. You have the freedom to go anywhere because that's what the degree has allowed you to do. Thank you, Edmund. Yes, so the universities that we work with are internationally recognized. We will advise you based on where you come from about the recognition, uh, the process required. We have experts from every uh, corner of the planet, people from the UK, from the Middle East, from other areas as well that will advise you and give you the guidance you need so you can make an informed decision on how possible it is for you to go back home. And of course, the priority will always be for us to advise you and give you information on options that are available for you to be able to go back home and succeed and be able to register as a doctor. So we'll talk a little bit now about um, coming back home, talking about coming back home. We'll expand a little bit more about it and uh, being able to return to your country and practice as a doctor. So um, we'll ask uh, one of our expert advisors, who is Tom, to tell us more about how he reassures students who want to return to their countries like uh, UK, Ireland, uh, Canada, Australia, and so on. Yeah, so when you're coming back home to work, um, obviously it's a very nerve wracking thing. First of all, it's probably what's on most of your minds with thinking about studying abroad is, am I going to be able to come back to my country? The last thing you want to do is to go and study and work so hard for years and years and years of your life just to come back home with a nice piece of paper and uh, nothing to do with it. 
So as an organization, we're very careful with the universities that we work with to make sure that they're meeting the requirements for the country that you want to go back to when you graduate. Now, obviously, these all vary from country to country. And that's why we've got our team here to help you through the process so that we can go into the specifics and help find the best solution for you. Um, in terms of the variations, with some of them, it's a little bit easier and some of them it's a little bit harder. But it's always possible. There are always opportunities in Europe for you to be able to find the right degree for you that will allow you to graduate and come back, whether it be sitting an entrance exam when you come back or whether it's just a simple case of uh, getting registered. The possibilities are always there. The opportunities are always there. And you've got our team with you from day one of having a phone call with us all the way to six years later when you're graduating and our team helping you to come back and register. Thank you, Tom, for that. And uh, Edmund, would you like to add anything on top of uh, what Tom added? This is great. Um, so coming back to the UK, I mean, I know we make a lot of references to the UK because that's where most of our students want to come back to. There are two, there are two pathways, really. If you come back from the European Union, generally um, you qualify to go for full licensing. So that means you go into the foundation year two. And then coming back from non-EU country, then you go for the provisional license, meaning you can do foundation year one. The roles are quite similar in its sense. One is more kind of um, an advanced role. And then the one is kind of a, a foundation year to prove yourself before you start going into the bigger roles. But the admission or the process of actually getting work uh, has nothing to do with the university. So whether you've gone to university in Georgia or whether you've gone to one in Italy, the process of getting registration won't have any bearings to where you've gone to. Uh, but as Tom has you know, uh, explained really clearly and very well, um, we help and we look for universities. And as we're talking to you now, we're still looking at other universities that we can work with that would allow you guys to come back and work as doctors, because that's what we care about, for you to come back. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, uh, Edmund and Tom. Yes, the priority is to be able to help you come back home. So this will be something that will be discussed with your expert advisor to give you as much guidance as possible on it. Uh, so we'll talk about the clinical rotations in the UK now. I will ask um, Emma, who has been helping many students from our uh, student base, uh, secure their places in Bart's Hospital and other hospitals across the UK. Hello, how are you? I'm Emma. I have uh, done my clinical rotations in the UK as well. So this is how I began helping other students. Um, the clinical rotations in the UK are brilliant, they're fab. And the most important thing is that you can actually converse with the patient in your own language, um, in, in English, um, if you want. And actually, there's a lot of foreign patients that you can get to talk to in your own language. So there's French, you meet Italians, loads of Italians and uh, people from all over the world that you can actually um, talk to. And when you're doing clinical exams, uh, examinations, there's different departments that you rotate through. So emergency medicine, um, there's internal medicine, there's surgery, obs and gynae, pediatrics, there's rotations in psychiatry, neurology. Um, there's so many different choices for you to do. and there's a specific um, uh, amount of clinical rotations that um, you're required to do and um, MedLinks will guide you on that. And so what the hospitals do is try and follow the clinical rotations set by the university as close as possible um, so that you get your clinical requirements for the GMC. So when you finish each rotation, for example, if you have to do, I think maybe is it, is it five weeks or six weeks in internal medicine, um, after each rotation, you get signed off by your consultants. So you'll be following, you'll be consultant led on your rotations, you get signed off. And uh, this, this clinical rotation sheet that you get signed off, it's, it's like a score sheet of how you've acted, how you've been with patients, what, how your clinical examinations um, has gone. Um, and you get this sheet and you give it to your clinical preceptor. 
who um, keep, they keep a copy because sometimes GMC after each rotation, uh, they can call. They can call and ask, was this student rotating at this hospital? Uh, did they complete this rotation for this amount of time? So each hospital that you rotate in will keep your record. So that's also good. There's, there's proof from the hospital, from the consultant that you've done the rotation. And if GMC have any question marks, they can just call the hospital and you have sort of like that backup that you did do the rotations and it's recorded. And in any case, the rotation sheet that you have that you get signed off, you should send it to either Medlinks or keep it for you. Keep obviously keep a copy for yourself or give it to someone or your, uh, your advisor at Medlinks. And so um, apart from that, what else do you get to do? You get to do study days at the hospital. At, at the moment during COVID, they're limiting massive groups of students conversing uh, uh, to, uh, or conversion on the labs together. So they're doing smaller groups of students uh, where you do suturing, you do emergency situations. So they put you in a situation where, for example, someone has had a heart attack and you have a doll and you have to basically go through the guidelines of how you deal with someone and how what medicine what medications you should give them like i don't know if you if anyone knows so you can memorize sort of like the better blockers then noxaparin the morphine the oxygen you you just sort of make sure that you know the list of um medications and the and the way you um can prescribe these to the patients and it really helps when you're doing these clinical situations because um, the consultant also is looking at how you act. This may be not be in all hospitals, but they look at how you act and how you interact. You don't have to be brilliant and you don't need to know everything, but just as long as you get in, get stuck in, even get it wrong. I mean, it's a doll most of the time. So uh, get it wrong. If you get in and you practice, you get so much confidence and it's fun. It's, it, you get to meet other doctors, you get to meet uh, other consultants, you make friends, you get contacts, you know, that will get you into other hospitals or actually get you abroad. I met a few Australians that gave us, gave me some guidelines of where to go in Australia. So uh, if I want, well, when the COVID restrictions is over, I can do some rotations in Aussie, which I'd love, or Canada. Met a few Canadians at the hospital when I was rotating. So you'll, you'll get to meet so many different people and get so many different opportunities. And if there's something that you really like, like I liked, um, uh, like general practice medicine, if you want to do like an elective, if that after you've done your main core rotations, you can do extra uh, GP rotations. You get involved in OSCEs. So if there's any kind of exams going on for doctors who are for doctors who are doing a, do, doing any kind of exams or OSCEs, they always ask you. The hospitals ask the students to get involved. So this is your perfect time to actually practice OSCEs for uh, PLAB two. So you get loads of practice. You may get it wrong, like I said, but at least you know what to expect when you when it's your turn. And um, and for, in terms of PLAB one examinations, sometimes they give you like little guidance on what you should read and 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 documents what you should uh, revise. So and last thing, you should know your clinical examinations, your basic clinical examinations, uh, resp, cardiology abdomen, so gastroenterology, know your basic neurology, you should know your neurology for surgery because the surgeons normally ask you um, just make sure before you start each rotation a few days, a week before, whatever, go over each clinical rotation, uh, cl clinical examination, the basics, you know, and there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Emma, that was very informative. Uh, one question we have in the Q&A section is, uh, do you usually have to pay extra fees to do your clinical rotations? Yes, of course, as you would expect, the hospital has its own costs as well for hosting you and looking after you. Uh, so there, you should expect uh, some fees as well that you would have to pay to the hospitals directly. Uh, would you like to add anything to that, Emma, or do you think that answers the question? That answers the question. All right, brilliant. Okay, so if you guys would like to also ask Emma any questions, then feel free to uh, write them in the Q&A. We'll go to the Q&A section now and uh, answer all your questions. There's plenty of questions that have come up. So um, let's see. Uh, the first one I see here that I think uh, Amira can answer would be, um, how do students manage with crop one and crop two? So how do they get on with it? What do they do? Now we'll explain what CROC is. Uh, 
uh, Amira, and uh, then we'll go into how people prepare for it and what we can do to help students. Okay, so CROC 1 is a state exam that you do to be able to go into your clinical year. So it's basically an exam for your whatever you studied for the year one, two, and three. It's easy if you study. If you've been studying throughout your three years, it's easy. For those who come to graduate entry, you have the background already. Uh, Sometimes you'll find it a little bit hard in terms of memorizing or remembering the little details we tend to forget. However, you do get classes, you do get extra classes, for example, on Saturdays, anatomy classes are provided by Dr. Igor. Um, we have MedLink that provided um, classes for CROC 1, where I am teaching as well. And some teachers, most of the exam, they're very nice. What they do is they give you questions for CROC 1, and they tend to give this as an exam uh, for the written part, and then they ask you questions for the oral part. So they kind of prepare you for this. And CROC 2, as you can guess, CROC 2 will be an exam for your clinical years, which students like way more, as this is something related to you, to you, what you want to do. So with this, it becomes a bit easier where you don't tend to need tuition so much or classes. However, teachers do ask you a lot of questions. They grill you. I have this one teacher and she keeps asking lots of detail and give you little tricks and they tell you for croc, this is what they do. So as long as you study, croc is very easy. I've enjoyed it, to be honest. I'm a weird one. <laughs> I really do enjoy croc that I'm teaching it now, but you shouldn't worry about it at all. Yeah, and also, yeah, Emma just wrote there, she has her tips and tricks. Uh, go to her uh, TikTok or social media, any, and then you'll see what she says about her clock experience. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Amira. And uh, just to mention to you guys, Amira was one of the highest scoring people on CROC 1 exam. Not to embarrass you, Amira, but uh, you have to get some recognition there. Uh, Amira is very good at what she does. and. Um, what happened is that the university has offered her a position to teach the younger years, um, the CROC 1. So uh, the student, the, Amira has been teaching over Zoom CROC 1 uh, classes to show them the, show the students tips and tricks on how to pass and how to ace the exam like she did. So well done, Amira, and thank you for that. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Osman. Okay, so uh, we'll go to the next question. I see for Chris here, there's a question that might be suitable. Um, will textbooks be provided? How do students manage generally by uh, uh, avoiding paying for textbooks and not having to... Uh, uh, how, how do they do it in Europe? I'll let you answer that. Um, well, in Bulgaria, no, textbooks aren't provided by the uni fees. Um, in classes, you will have to buy like a workbook, but they're very cheap. Like uh, for us, it's the currency here is levs. So one workbook's five levs which is about two pounds for the uh, English. Um, for textbooks, uh, you can, there's many options. One is you can buy officially the textbook, which is the expensive uh, option. Second is uh, you can go to many uh, copy shops. Uh, they'll have PDF files of the actual textbook that you can print, uh, which makes it way cheaper. And if you just want the PDF file to read from computer, uh, all the older students have it. Um, we have a Google Drive, which all the students have access to, uh, with every single textbook that the um, the doctors or the teachers that I recommend for us to use uh, when we study. And that's it. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Uh, usually, most uh, doctors and professors will provide you with a PDF version of uh, the textbooks and. Uh, most uh, universities will also give you the information on their portal or online or in a USB stick. So um, that's not a big deal or something really big to worry about. Uh, I think you have more important things to worry about, like uh, passing your medical exams and gaining the knowledge and learning and so on. Uh, that's the exciting part. Uh, OK, so do we have any other questions? I'm just looking now. If anyone has any questions they would like to answer, um, Oh, I see one. Is CROC for dentistry or for medicine? Amy, would you like to answer this one? Guys, I'm taking my CROC exam in three days. 
Um, so croc is for medicine, dentistry, and I think even pharmacy. So yeah, that answers your question. And I'm doing croc one on Tuesday, guys. So I'll let you know how it goes. Thank you, Amira, for your great classes. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Amy. One more question for you is, uh, what's it like doing graduate entry entering the third year? Oh, yeah. So obviously, graduate entry, it is like doing three years in one. So can you prepare for it? Not really, like you can like maybe like revise notes from your pre previous de degree. But like, I don't think anything can prepare you for like how much what like your workload that you're going to have um but my advice is just to keep on top of all your classes keep organized and just take advantage of all that the extra classes that amira was talking about anatomy classes crop prep classes don't just um don't just put off crop prep until the end of the year because i know a few students like didn't start doing crop prep until the end of the year while while i've been doing crop prep classes since november so all along the way um, but it's definitely doable like the university provides you with so much so many resources and medlink too um, in relation to chris he was talking about the textbooks and stuff don't waste money on buying like expensive books before you come um, i know you you probably want to prepare for like um, graduate entry but you will get so many resources um, Medlink even have their own um, Ken Hub um, account that's a great resource for anatomy and histology so there's so many resources out there just try not to be too overwhelmed by everything and um, once you get organized and motivated students in your class you'll make friends and it's great when you form like study groups etc um but yeah it's definitely doable and yeah it's just going to be um kind of an intense year but once you get get it done then you've compacted you've saved yourself two years which is really cool and then you can start the fun bit like your clinical years so yeah it's a great opportunity brilliant uh, thank you amy that's very informative um edmund uh, i have a question for you why is Dnipro medical institute called institute this is a great question. And uh, we get asked this quite a lot. And I think I think most students are concerned about the university not being a university. Now, the law states that if a university teaches one subject, for example, medicine, they call it, med, uh, they call it uh, an academy or an institute. Now, if a university teaches, say, many subjects like architecture, art, biology, maths, they call it university. Thank you, Edmund, for that. Uh, a lot of students worry, OK, is it um, about this because maybe they get their information from the wrong place. It's important not to get bogged down by the wrong things, because what matters is the university is recognized. It's recognized internationally uh, in the USA, in the UK and uh, Australia and many, many other countries that there have been hundreds and thousands of graduates have graduated from there and returned back to their countries and uh, worked successfully. Remember, the medical councils, uh, for example, the General Medical Council doesn't care what the name of the university is. They don't care what uh, ranking the university has or what color the building is or um, uh, how many you know teachers it has or doesn't have. What they care is their criteria being met. As long as you meet these criteria, you have nothing to worry about because the General Medical Council will accept the degree based on meeting its criteria. Uh, because then it means that it means that the university meets the criteria, the standards expected by the UK. And you must always look at what the General Medical Council is saying. For example, there are there is a list um, that says universities that we do not accept and you must check that the university you're going to does not uh, is not listed there and another list is that um, universities that we may accept this is also the reason for this list is there are universities on there that is very important for you to google and check for yourself to find this list is that uh, or maybe we'll post it in the chat as well here so you can firsthand with your own eyes check what it says on that page, because as long as the university is not listed there, it means the GMC has not expressed concerns about that university. All right, uh, we'll move on to the next question. 
Um, entry exam. There's some questions for Aryan about the entry exam in uh, Bialystok. Would you be able to tell uh, students a little bit more, Aryan? Yes, so I've had a few questions so in the Q&A section uh, and they were all asking how like tough is it to pass the entry exam. I was provided with all the materials by Medlinx and like I said, I actually applied very late. So I didn't have really much time to prepare for these. I had two days to be exam. So if I'm able to pass the entry exam with, with like two days, all the people that are watching now, they have months to prepare. Like I said, it doesn't, it really doesn't take all that time. Like they could probably like take like, 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 like I said, like even me two days or a week and they pass the exam. So honestly, if that's like the entry exam is nothing to worry about. So uh, like for the medical university, to be honest. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Aryan. I'm trying to find some uh, other questions as well. Um, while you're doing that, can I just add to yes. this what uh, Ariane said as well? Ariane is a very smart kid. Now, we're very pleased with uh, Ariane, and we don't recommend students taking two days coming to us and saying, we are going to study for two days. Don't do what Ariane did. What we advise is that let's speak early on and allow you the chance to prepare. These are biology and chemistry, things that you already know. But taking two days will give you uh, very much pressure to, to get through it. So let's speak early on. Don't do what Ariane did and take two days. <laughs> very good point. Yes, Edmund, thank you. Uh, we want you guys to succeed and you are, it's a huge deal for you to gain to medical school. So. Uh, um, please don't come to us and uh, have the expectation that you're going to pass the exam by just reading one book, for example. You should know your knowledge, you should, uh, you're going to become a doctor, so um, yes, uh, not everyone has the same learning capabilities or the same intelligence, but that's fine, you know, you don't have to be a genius to become a doctor. And this is something that has, uh, lots of students have proved to us because they've come and they started medicine. Some people take three months to study for an exam, some people take one day. But you should not compare yourself to others, compare yourself to yourself. It's your journey, it's your personal struggles, it's your personal success as well. So come to us early, don't leave it last minute, don't come to us one day before the deadline, tell us please help me. Because of course we would love to help you and we will try everything we can to help you. But you must also do your part as well and be proactive. Start your journey, start uh, getting information, start making a decision very early. It's already very late. It's almost July. You have July and August and that's it. The September and October is when the universities start. So the deadlines are fast approaching. In fact, some universities, their deadlines have passed already. So don't leave it too late. Um, don't sit on it too long. You already know that you want to study medicine. So don't postpone it. Let's get started. We want to help you study medicine. We want you to get started and uh, you're going to love it. You're, I'm sure you're going to love it. Every single one of our students who has been here on the panelists uh, list has also been very nervous. They've called us every day, maybe sometimes at night. Oh, what's this? I have this question. I'm a bit, a bit worried. I don't know if I should go. Oh, the plane got delayed, you know, but we're here for you. That's why we're here to ensure that you have all the support you need so you can succeed and come to Europe. All right, let's find some more questions then. Uh, by the way, I posted in the chat some information about the maybe accepted list because I know some students ask us about it thinking that it's a good thing that university is listed there. But also I've quoted exactly what the GMC says about the maybe accepted list. So it's important that you read carefully what it says on this page. So you understand for yourself, not listen to what other people tell you about this list because uh, it's, it explains why people are why universities are listed on this. All right, so next question, uh, let's see. Um, anyone here sees any question while I'm looking? Because there's so many already. Anything that you guys uh, would like to answer? Um, Alikia as well, um, there's one for you about India. Uh, can students practice in India after completing medicine from the EU or from Europe in general, not just EU? Yes, so like I was going to take up that question. So uh, like 
earlier there was this exam which was the medical council of india mci exam that one had to give to even after coming from abroad and uh, that was the licensing exam uh, but now they have uh, like changed the criteria and they have just put a national exit exam which will be implemented from next year that is 2022 and uh, uh, in this exam like both the indian students who are in practicing in india and as well as the foreign students who are practicing abroad both uh, are going to get like equal standards for the exam as well as the criteria for the marks and after you obtain the marks your results and getting selected for your postgraduate seats all are going to be the same and equal for the foreign students as well as the students already studying in india okay uh, thank you akia that's uh, very good yes you can usually practice worldwide with the degrees that you gain in europe uh one question was about uh, the difference between five and six year courses uh the five year course is usually a bachelor's course the six year course is usually equal to a master's course because it's one year longer and includes usually extra studies like uh, the the junior doctor year usually uh edmund i have a question for you uh that's do you advise students to go and do their clinics in person or on uh not online in uh, their country this is a great question and we would always recommend the students do their rotations at the university the reason we do this is because this gives you exposure to dealing with different types of patients dealing with as emma explained you get to meet uh, patients from different countries that you get to treat we also recommend that students do electives during the holidays this way you can work or have some experience in the uh, hospitals that you like to work in or in the country that you'd like to actually work in whether it's the uk whether it's australia whether it's canada but it's always best to do your rotations we would advise that students do their rotations on campus to give them exposure uh, to do the specific uh, journey that they will have with the uh, the lecturers there brilliant thank you edmund and amy what would you add on top of this do you think students should uh, do their rotations at home or would you advise like you did uh, to come and do it in uh, the country that they're studying in um okay so i would just say um for me obviously i'm on quite a low budget so uh for one it's very expensive um to do rotations in the uk i'm sure they are great and obviously that was my first option i love living abroad i can't actually wait to start practicing in um hospitals here like um doing my clinical rotations here and um, so I I think it's a better opportunity to be able to work do your degree abroad and um, clinical rotations abroad because let's face it you're going to go back to the UK and be working in the English hospitals for the rest of your life you might as well do 3 years in a different country um before going to your English you know that's that's going to be your career so why not spice it up a bit and you know get experience in a different country um you have to remember that the degree your degree is just like the start of your journey like once you graduate you're not going to know everything it's just the start and so why not get a load of different in the experiences in a country abroad and you're also going to bring all of that to the um to UK hospitals and like maybe learn different techniques and stuff that yeah you can bring to the UK as well so yeah i would i would do it in the country you're studying and and save some money <laughs> yeah brilliant thank you amy exactly it's your opportunity as a young person as someone who's still a student to enjoy uh and uh, enjoy and take advantage of this uh, really nice opportunity you know have fun with it come abroad explore meet people from every corner of the planet meet people have friends from japan china africa middle east uh, usa canada america ireland uk you know how amazing is that having that atmosphere i think every one of our students here on the panel will tell you that they love the internationalism they love how global it is all in one place uh all with one goal all these people a huge community come and uh, 
uh, it's like uh, you know the pilgrimage you know you go and travel with the pursuit of the big picture you know you're not uh, there for oh is the food nice is the food not nice you know it's all about the big picture and you see yourself as you know what i'm gonna make sacrifices i'm gonna leave my family for a couple of months you know i'll see them once a year or twice a year and then i'm gonna be able to become a doctor what i've always loved to do what i've always um, as a child fantasized about or uh, whatever your journey and your motivation is, uh, that's the best feeling about it. You know that in the end, you're going to become a doctor, you're going to come back home and you're going to do what you love rather than settle for science or biology or uh, something that you're not so passionate about. Um, so thank you for answering that. Anyone else would like to pick any questions uh, from the Q&A section as well? Um, okay, so um, usually uh, I'm getting here a question about when do you usually start to get clinical years? Uh, so, I mean, when do you usually start to learn clinics? Uh, would like to, would someone like to answer this for us? Maybe Amy, you can answer that. When do you learn the clinical skills? Um, so, obviously I've been doing most of my um, learning online. So mainly I've just been learning um, uh, um, so not many like practical skills because it's literally all theory for especially the croc however I have had a few offline lessons like suturing and um, like learning injections you do learn um, if it's not online uh, you do for all of our modules we have a nursing um, module as well so there is a nursing module for um, I think general surgery internal medicine and one other I forgot so you do get introduced to clinical skills in third year graduate medicine um, and then the main clinical skills you are learning in fourth year so yeah it's mainly theory in the first three years yeah thank you Amy another question quickly that's come up is from someone from South Africa um, do they need to do an entrance exam in English to prove that they speak English? Usually it depends, of course. Uh, I know you don't like to hear that. I wish it was a black and white, yes or no, but it depends. Uh, so it's a gray area. It depends on the university. Some universities will accept a letter. What we usually do to work around this is uh, we will speak with the university and try to um, liaise with them to fix this and make sure that they accept that you speak English fluently. Some universities will ask you to do an English exam, but it's an English exam. If you speak English comfortably or even uh, good enough, you can communicate through English, then you should be fine. If you watch movies and uh, go on Facebook in English, then uh, you're not going to have a big issue. You know, a lot of um, our uh, students love memes as well, uh, like on our um, Instagram, which you should check out. Uh, the memes are usually in English and that usually a lot of students, I ask them, how do you know English so well? They're like, I spend a lot of time on the internet, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, watching memes, watching videos, you know. Uh, so there's plenty of chances and opportunities there available for you. Um, another question I'm seeing here, can someone transfer into the final year of medicine? Um, usually you have to transfer into the fifth year. There is it's rare and but it is possible but it's really rare as well most universities will ask you to transfer into the maximum of the fifth year because they want to educate you as well and uh, unless you have a very very specific reason but uh, this is a very particular question and it depends on the particular circumstances and a lot of factors are involved so you should contact us and speak to us about this so we can advise you um any more questions that uh, you guys can see that you'd like to answer, just feel free to shout at me. Um, I see also um, we posted in the chat a certificate of attendance so you guys can fill it in, give us some feedback about the conference and uh, today's webinar and uh, we'll uh, provide you with uh, a certificate of attendance. And uh, if there's any more questions, you should ask your final questions now before we close off. I see there are plenty of questions, hundreds, but it's so hard to pick uh, which ones to answer because a lot of them are very specific and they require you having to contact us and speak to us. Uh, another one that's come up is, is it really safe for a Muslim girl who wears a hijab um, to come and study in Europe? Okay, let's see, who would like to answer this one? 
Uh, maybe Rihan, you you are, come from a Muslim background, right? I think. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Osman. Um, my experience of uh, I can only speak about Karova because around the, it's a very safe uh, city, and we have um, police presence very visible. They do patrolling, you know. Um, it's uh, I mean the the people are very friendly. Um, I haven't heard of any crime or any sort of form of like, you know, hate crime or, uh, you, know, you know, like that. It's a very safe city, but you do get to see a lot of police patrolling, like I'm um, seeing the cars, visible presence. Um, so no, nothing to feel um, unsafe about. Um, and they welcome you um, because you are a foreign student, you are investing into the economy and in return, you're getting the best of medical education. Um, oh, to, I mean, I've been, my year, a year of experience tells me that there's a lot of girls that wear hijab and, and stuff like that I, in, in my cohort. And I haven't had anything um, like of crime or anything of that nature. So my overall conclusion is it's absolutely safe. Yes, uh, thank you, Rihan. And also for the girls as well, um... Uh, Akia and uh, Amy, would you be able to tell us more about safety? Because a lot of students worry because we get people from all over the planet, people that are all sorts of backgrounds and colors, people who are uh, white, brown, black, everything. So people that come from different various backgrounds who come and study in Europe. In general, we've not had any issues with racism, but I would leave that for Amy and Akia. And maybe Emma, you can chip in as well. Akia? Just quickly, would you be able to tell us your experience in Georgia? So uh, about this question, I wanted to say that most of the girls and guys in Georgia, they are basically coming, majority of them are coming from Turkish, uh, from Turkey, as well as from Iran and Iraq. So most of them are from the Muslim community. And I guess it's very safe in here. And I've never felt like any kind of racism or um, like any kind of problem being a girl here. So that's a bit that I wanted to add. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, thank you. One question we're getting is, uh, I think we, we may have not uh, spoken clearly about this regarding the rotations. Some students are asking now, do you need to pay for rotations in the university itself? No, you don't. You just pay your tuition fees and that's it. You attend university at normal. This is just for the people that want to do something uh, different and just don't want to do the normal program. Uh, or cannot do the normal program. They have to, they are taking a different path at their own choice and they are deciding to pay. No, you will not have to pay anything extra on top of your tuition fees. If you are doing your rotations in a private hospital or a hospital in general, then the hospital will charge you, but not, this is a hospital in the UK, in the USA, a hospital that's in your own home country, not a hospital that's in the university itself. The university, has contra contracts with hospitals or owns hospitals in order to provide you with free uh, rotations. So you don't need to pay if you are doing your rotations in Georgia, you don't need to pay anything on top of your tuition fees. You just pay your tuition fees, that's it. Okay, um, I think that's it. We've answered a lot of questions unless there's any more uh, burning questions that you guys would like to answer. We should close off. We would love to answer all these hundreds of questions I wish we could stay all night, but our students as well, they need to sleep and they have exams to study for. So uh, we don't want to keep them too long here. Uh, thank you all for vo volunteering to come here um, just simply with the intention of just giving information with no expectations of anything in return. It's so nice of you guys. And I hope our future potential students as well will be like you guys volunteering to give information and uh, help and reassure future students just out of the goodness of your heart, like you have all done. So thank you all, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everyone, for uh, organizing and taking the time out uh, to attend our webinar as well. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you found even one piece of information reassuring and uh, that motivated you to become a doctor, uh, to, uh, to pursue medicine abroad, because the path is there, the opportunity is there. It's all on you now. The options are so much, there are so much paths, so much options, so much universities and so much potential that you can have. All you have to do is just take that leap of faith um, and be confident in yourself. Trust your, trust the big picture, trust your dreams because one day you're gonna become a doctor 
like everyone here, you're going to be on that journey and you're going to love that journey because you're going to be exploring a new culture and it's going to be so exciting because in the big picture, you're going to, you're going to become a doctor. Don't put it off. Don't just sit on it and be indecisive. Make a choice. Decide that you want to pursue medicine. Let's get started. Get in touch with us. You have seen uh, throughout the presentation, there's been these uh, QR codes. So you just scan them with your phone. You can enter our website and submit a form to speak to one of our experts here. And our experts are more than happy to answer your questions at any time. They will always uh, be more than happy to help you and reassure you and give you all this free information that we're giving now because we want to encourage people to pursue medicine however they go, whether they come with us or not. If you come with us, you're going to have a second family for you. You're going to have the meddling family. We're going to look after you. We're going to help you. We're going to make sure that you have all the right support to streamline the process and make it as stress-free as possible. So um ask all your questions to us go on the website send them off ask all your questions and let's get in touch let's speak let's chat and uh, we look forward to encouraging you and hoping to help you pursue your dream of studying medicine here are our and dentistry as well by the way here are our contact details wherever you are in the world uh, hopefully you can call one of these numbers or email us for free you don't need to call uh, and we'll be more than happy to support you and we'll get in touch with you as soon as possible and give you all the information you need so you can make an informed decision on what's best for you. All the information we give will be honest, transparent, and we will be there to guide you because you it's all about you and making sure you complete your journey or you make a decision on what's best for you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I really hope you have a great day and a great weekend as well. And uh, Thank you again to our panelists for taking the time out of your busy schedules and busy exam periods as well to join us and answer all these questions. Uh, it's been great. And uh, I hope you guys find the, found it helpful. Get in touch with us. Let us know your feedback by submitting a form in the chat. I submitted a form for a certificate of attendance. So uh, type there uh, your feedback, send it to us. We'd love to hear from you so we can make the webinars always more and more helpful. All right, take care everyone. Have a great evening.